to the sixth year of the Greater Good series. Uh, this is a part of the Make a Living, Make a Different series. And I'm Mark Hardy, Director of uh, Nonprofit Executive Programs, and I will be your moderator this evening. Uh, but most of the talking will be done by the two people here to my left, and I'll introduce them in just a, a, a moment. A special thanks is due to the Master of Nonprofit Administration Program and the Masters of Business Administration Program for bringing this event to us for the past six years. Uh, we especially want to thank Kim Brennan, who is in the back there doing uh, traffic control. And uh, she's the manager of the Nonprofit Administration Program. And Cindy Prophet, who could not be here with us tonight, um, she is the Assistant Director of Career Development uh, in the MBA program. And also, Matt Money, where's Matt at? Was he hiding? Is he over there? Matt, there's Matt Money, yeah. Matt uh, stepped in to help uh, since he uh, could not uh, be here for the last couple of weeks. So thank you very much, Matt, for all of your uh, help. And of course, this is totally a volunteer uh, activity for everyone here. And uh, so we appreciate their help in uh, putting this together. Matt is with the MBA program as well. So tonight, our presenters are going to address a topic that is rapidly gaining momentum in the nonprofit sector, measuring and getting results. It seems that gone were the days where people just gave money to an organization because it was a worthy cause. Now they want to know what is the social return on our investment. And when I say investment, I, I speak in very large terms here because uh, last year, according to Giving USA, uh, giving in America by individuals was around $300 billion. It was, total giving was $300 billion. Giving by individuals, people like you and me, was around $218 billion. It's a lot of money. So um, with those kinds of figures, the pressure is on nonprofits to um, tell their public and their donors what are you doing with the money? What kind of results are you getting? And tonight, uh, our presenters have assured me that they will have the answers to all of these questions. Everything you want to know about measurement of nonprofit success is right here in these two minds. Um, we're probably going to have a lot more questions than we have answers, quite frankly. This is a new and emerging uh, area in nonprofit, uh, in the nonprofit field and the philanthropic field. And so people are trying to figure out how all this works. How do you measure the success of the Center for the Homeless? How do you measure the success of a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter uh, in other areas? I mean, how do you measure that? And so um, these are things that we may not have answers to for, for a long time, but we're going to try to address those. So uh, we were trying to decide who was going to speak first tonight. And uh, we had a, a, a small uh, dinner earlier and we decided uh, to have a wrestling match. <laughs> and the uh, winner would decide who was going to go first. And I have to say that Dan lost. And, uh, was and it was ugly. Uh, and as a result, he has to go first. So um, with that, I want to introduce Dan. Uh, Dan Morrison is the founder and CEO of Citizen Effect, an innovative nonprofit that gives citizen philanthropists the ability to support impactful organizations and projects around the world. Combining the best in new social network technology and personal relationships building, Citizen Effect has empowered and inspired a grassroots movement of individuals who have completed hundreds of high-impact community projects in over 20 countries, including the U.S. Dan brings a global perspective, but assures local results. He appreciates the power of technology without losing sight of personal relationships. But before founding Citizen Effect, Dan worked at uh, Profit, a top brand and marketing strategy firm, and uh, Kukmarski and Associates. Was that good? Thank you. <laughs> uh, respected for its work in innovation consult in innovative consulting. Uh, Dan studied history at the University of Notre Dame. He's one of our alumni, and he holds a graduate degree from the University of Chicago in Middle Eastern Studies. So, ladies and gentlemen, warm hand for Dan Morrison. I guess we'll hear about you later. Yeah. All right. It, the wrestling match was ugly, but I have the privilege of speaking with the beautiful Angela today. So, um, ironically, we at Profit did actually new mutual people. So, it's one of those important networking things that is so important to nonprofits. So, uh, who's on Twitter? Anybody? All right, so uh, ready? At Dan Citizen. And I 
today. Um, we're talking about measurement and metrics, so I fully expect to go back to my Twitter account later tonight and be able to measure the number of people that actually tweeted and mentioned me today. So um, um, let's make sure that that happens. Um, so I come at this from a little bit different perspective. Uh, my, my career was um, as a um, kind of business strategy, brand strategy consultant. Uh, which um, is one of those occupations that when someone asks you what you do, uh, you kind of just mumble and talk for about five minutes and actually really have no idea yourself. So um, I was having this dilemma. Um, I had the great fortune to work in profit and then be sent to Japan to start our, our Tokyo office. And uh, I was just sitting at my desk one day thinking, wow, I love the complex problems I get to work on. I love the people I work with. I love that I get to live in Japan for free um, and make a good, good salary. But uh, there's no alignment between the work that I do and the beliefs that I have. And um, it's probably one of the curse, curses of going to Notre Dame is you actually develop a conscience and values um, and morals. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, unless you're at Club 23 and you don't remember it. But um, the, um, and so I, I made the decision to try to align. And um, like most people that want to change their life but don't know how, I went back to grad school, um, got a degree from the University of Chicago in Middle Eastern Studies, you know, got to travel to Syria and, and Palestine and the Middle East, and came back to D.C. to start consulting around Middle East um, development issues. And um, then, as um, happens, you meet people that change the trajectory of your life and uh, when you least expect it. I was um, working with the Clinton Global Initi Initiative on their big New York um, meeting uh, in 2006, and I met Rima Nanavati, who is the, uh, one of the heads of the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEWA. And she's about this tall, and she is probably the most amazing, impactful person that I've ever met. Um, I kind of describe her as, you know, Bono, Mick Jagger, and Madonna all wrapped up into one because she's probably the softest spoken person, but when she opens up her mouth, um, kind of like E.F. Hutton. Does anybody ever even remember E.F. Hutton? Right. Yeah, funny. That's aging me right now. Uh, <laughs> right now. Oh my goodness. Um, people listen, right? And so she and she just delivers this amazing message, and she invited me to go to India. And so I went to India to visit um, Sewa and the work that they're doing. Um, Sewa is an amazing organization. It's actually the largest trade union in India, uh, but all of its members are women and they're what um, would be defined as poorest of the poor. So rag pickers, street vendors, poor artisans, poor farmers. And I had the privilege of um, meeting many of them and touring around for two weeks, which wasn't nearly enough to really understand it. Um, but it was uh, long enough for a um, naive, idealistic, bald white dude to kind of say, wow, um, maybe this is my pivot point. This is the opportunity for me actually to align my values and you know do something of impact. Um, and so I met this woman that was walking four hours a day for water, and she um, said to me, she goes, listen, everyone who I talk to tells me I need a micro loan. But, and this is, this is when Kiva was just starting, and you know, kind of the Muhammad Yunus was starting to get all of the press. And she said to me, she said, listen, but listen, I spent all of my time collecting water collecting wood and making sure that my family has the basic basics so they can survive. Um, so I don't have any time to use a micro loan. Um, she goes, but what I know will have an impact on me is the ability to access water and not walk four hours a day. And we have a sustainable source of water in our village right beneath our feet um, and we need $5,000 to build a well. So partner with me and um, build that well. If you can, if you can raise $5,000, I can't give it back to you, but I can guarantee you the social return on investment, the fact that this will have a transformational impact on this community. And um, being the naive, idealistic, bald white guy that I was, 
I took a hook line and sinker and um, went home, did a holiday card to friends and family, and got an immediate response um, from the most unlikely of sources. So my friend Rhonda emailed me and said, thank you for this opportunity. I didn't know this was possible to have such a direct line of sight to the impact that I could have. And she pledged to give me $500. Not to be outdone, her husband um, matched the $500. And then the, the next day I got an email from Ricardo Alvarez Diaz, who was my college roommate and best friend, one of my best friends from Notre Dame. And he sent me pretty much the same email. And he, it was almost word for word. He doesn't even know Rhonda, wasn't CC'd on that email, and he and his wife pledged another $500. Um, and so I, you know, when the, the best part of it was a couple days later, I opened up a card in the mail. And what's the best kind of card is when you open it up? Money oh, falls out. Money falls out. <laughs> God, you work at the nonprofit. So. <laughs> and so it was a check for $500, um, again, randomly. And it said, Dan, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I was talking to your mom. And it was from my high school English teacher, right? And so, there, I'm like, yeah, this is really interesting, because I sent the money off to, um, to India to say, well, they built the well, and in January, um, I'm sorry, May of 2007, they sent me a report with photos um, saying, listen, we've built the well, the water is fresh, um, but most importantly, um, Savita Ben has started a flour mill, and Poonam has started a grocery store, because they're not walking four hours a day for water, right? And so that's when, you know, I'm sitting there sobbing at my, you know, my dad's dining room table because I'm like, this is different. This isn't just me doing a project and then saying, hey, every year I'll raise $5,000 and try to do some good. This was an idea of if I could figure out how to become a platform by which anyone could actually connect with a uh, community in need and then had give them the tools by which to deliver the funds or you know what was needed for that community, that was something that you could scale and you could replicate and you could actually do a lot more good than just me doing you know 40 more projects before I kick the bucket, right? Um, so that brings me to measurement and impact is like probably like a typical entrepreneur, I didn't care about measurement and impact when I started. I was like, wow, here's a really cool idea. Um, I'm passionate about it. Um, I don't have to go slog and work for Mitsubishi Motors or Visa or someone else. I can actually work on something that I think is fascinating and I'm passionate about. Um, and then you, so you sell everything on passion and you, know, you get people involved and then all of a sudden um, you get a knock on the door, a phone call from and someone like Eric Schmidt, um, the chairman of Google, who is like, we want to give you $300,000 to help build this out and scale this organization. What's your business plan? Um, and you're like, well, <laughs> we have one. We'll, uh, we'll send, I need to freshen it up. I'll send it to you in about a week. <laughs> right? And then he spent a week staring at an Excel spreadsheet trying to make numbers work, right? And so I think, um, and, but then the, the same is also, so as we think about metrics and measurement at Citizen Effect, there's two levels of it. There is the, what I'll call the, um, the mission impact, right? So we're a mission-driven organization, so what's the impact we're going to have on people, and how are we going to measure that? Right, and then what is the you know then what is the metrics we're going to use to um, really measure the business side of it, right? Like as far as um, driving earned revenue and, and donations and all of those things, and so that was it. Really, um, you know, I had an idea early on of, of definitely of the measurement and metrics I wanted on the mission side. So we decided very early on that. Um, a dollar, um, dollars weren't as important as lives impacted, right? And because we were working, we weren't working on, you know, five million dollar U.S. aid development projects, right? We were building wells for five thousand dollars. We were funding uh, child care centers for fifteen hundred dollars, right? And we knew that in Vasharajpur village there were five hundred and fifty people. And we knew if we built a well in their village, 550, and it worked, 550 people would get access to fresh water and say what was there um, to measure whether or not that happened or not. 
we knew that a child care center in, um, in Chaklasi Village uh, had 12 students. And we knew if we funded those 12 students would not only get an education, you know, start up their education, we knew they'd get two hot meals a day, which was probably more important than education. And we also knew that it would employ two teachers, right? So we knew very specifically about $5,000 equals not only 550 people with access to water, but that now what's going to happen with women starting small businesses. We could measure things very specifically. Um, and so that was kind of the easy part, honestly, for us. Um, and then it was great. Now we sold Eric Schmidt on the mission. He loved all of that. But he's like, how are you going to become a sustainable organization in five years? How are you going to make sure in five years you're not asking me or anyone else for more money because you've been able to generate your own earned revenue to pay your bills because of your business model, right? Um, and that was something I was very passionate about as well because I did, I hate fundraising. Like it's the most, I mean, how many people work in the nonprofit field here? I'm assuming a lot, right? Fundraising is the most thankless, mind-numbing, awful occupation on the face of the planet. And so for, I hats off to the fundraising people because you're, you're masochists, right? Because it's just not a fun thing to do. Um, and so I was like, the faster I can get out of fundraising and actually, but, but what I do like doing is generating revenue. Right, so how can we figure out how to generate revenue off of this um, business model that we have, even though that we're a nonprofit, right? Um, and I kind of set up early with my staff and my board is like, we are a 501c3 in legal status only, right? That doesn't, that it, it's not going to define who we are. It's not going to lead us to manage our business any differently than if we were a for-profit, right? We have some more red tape and you know bureaucratic things like 990s and others to take care of and board governance and other things. But when it comes down to the hardcore case of how do you run an efficient organization, we're going to run this just like a business, right? So I will I'll uh, one more thing to say and I'll leave it at that and then we can um, you know hand it off to Angela who will shed a lot more insight on this than I can. Um, is that we did we we weren't able to do it. Right, so right now we're trying to figure out how do we actually make deliver the mission along with the um, business model, and so we're like, we, we've helped, we seven hundred plus people have raised almost a million dollars via Citizen Effect, which has impacted tens of thousands of lives, which is phenomenal, right? But at this point in our evolution, we were supposed to be at, you know, a million. You know, a million plus five million a year, right? And so the question that I'm struggling with and that our board is struggling with is did we, was it the mission that we weren't able to deliver well enough or communicate well enough to then drive the operational investment into Citizen Effect in order to grow it? Or was it the business model that we took and just failed, didn't work, like wasn't the right business model? And I think that's the challenge for a lot of, I think it's a, the challenge for all nonprofits, um, but I think it's one that people need to become more and more aware of. Because if I, as I look at nonprofits, you know, most of them are um, in that situation. And so um, that's kind of what, you know, I think that's kind of where I'll leave it. I think that's the you know, kind of the grand nonprofit dilemma is. Sure, you can figure, measurement metrics are important, right? And you have to make sure you're measuring the social impact side as well as the business impact side. But then you also have to look how they're coupled together and how one serves the other. Um, and when you're failing at it, you have to figure out why well, are we failing because it's the business model is broken, or are we failing at it because um, there's something about the mission that is causing us not to be able to do what we need to do. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, and we're going to have uh, uh, Angela speak, and then we'll open it up for questions. But it's an interesting approach because the social entrepreneurship and uh, social business is a way that a lot of organizations are trying to fund uh, their mission now, and it's a challenge. And uh, I've already got a few questions awesome. to ask you, so uh, great. So uh, Angela Smith Cobb is uh, well; she was the director of Return on Inspiration Labs, but now you. You're the consultant who actually still runs it, right? Exactly. Are you still the director? I'm, I'm the director of the 
Okay, so you're the director of the new project, okay, the new options project, okay. So anyway, um, uh, the Return on uh, Inspiration Labs uh, is a social venture incubator and uh, she also leads uh, the New Options Project, an investment of W.K. Kellogg Foundation that connects out-of-school, job-seeking young, job young adults with alternative career paths. She has nearly two decades of experience in the areas of recruiting, diversity, community development, strategic philanthropy, and change management. Before uh, joining ROI Labs, she served as chief diversity officer at Teach for America, the country's national teaching corps. Uh, in this capacity, Angela led organization-wide diversity and inclusion efforts and was a member of the leadership team, and she has a, a deep expertise launching and leading new philanthropic business and programmatic ventures at a variety of organizations, including Allstate, Monster, and Athena International. You, both of you have for-profit backgrounds uh, coming into the nonprofit sector, okay. Um, a, and a nonprofit focused, uh, a, excuse me, Athena International, a nonprofit focused on women's leadership development. Angela also spent nearly a decade at Deloitte, an international professional con uh, services firm, and served in a variety of capacities, including working with leadership to launch and implement uh, firm-wide diversity initiatives, leading the firm's record-breaking philanthropic campaigns and supporting clients' organizational change initiatives as a change management consultant. She jo joined Deloitte in 1993 and uh, transitioned to the national recruiting staff in 1995. She is a member of the board of the uh, Umoja Student Development Corporation and serves on the advisory board of the Chicago Children's Museum. She received her MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, but most importantly, she has a BBA from the University of Notre Dame. Ladies and gentlemen, Angela Smithcott. I could just listen to Mark like forever. His, his voice is, is amazing. Um, so just a point of clarification. So I think all the, the signage says I'm the director of Return on Inspiration Labs. Um, which is part of ROI Ventures, and ROI Ventures merged with another firm uh, back in October, and after being a serial entrepreneur for many, many years, um, starting things for other people, I said, well, this feels like a good opportunity for me to start my own thing, and I'll continue to do the same thing, but I want you all to be my client. So I launched my own firm, essentially doing the same job, removing my financial risk as an entrepreneur, which was important, um, but continue to do the great work of leading the New Options Project um, for ROI Labs, which is uh, fantastic work that we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. So as I was listening to Dan, I was thinking about our roles on this panel, and I would say, you know, if you were to think about a course, um, He's like the highly specialized like financial accounting course, and I'm like first year seminar. Um, and I say that because you know I think Dan has really really deep experience within like an organization and dealing with some challenges that kind of in the types of roles that I've played within organizations, you know I've not faced in, in the same way. So hopefully together we can really you know paint a useful uh, picture for you. So you got my bio, and I wanted to just take a few minutes to kind of help you uh, understand kind of how I'm thinking about measurement and the different lenses that, that I'm bringing to the conversation. So the Athena Foundation, great organization. I remember discussions with the, the founder. Um, you know, it was one of those things like, why do we need to worry about measurement? We're doing good work. We're a nonprofit. We're not a business, right? And I, you know, always, you know, I've always come at this because I'm an accountant by trade, maybe, I don't know, with the mindset of you are always in the business of your mission. So re regardless of your tax status, you have, you know, a responsibility to stewardship of your resources to achieve, you know, the outcomes you set out to do. Um, you know, juxtapose that experience with, you know, Teach for America, which is, you know, probably among the most corporate of nonprofits. It's large, 
It has very highly sophisticated systems. It's national, actually, with Teach for All now international in reach. So just much more complex um, in terms of its organization and obsessed with data and measurement. Um, so very two different um, nonprofit experiences. Um, it was interesting because I was thinking about from a CSR perspective, so switching the tables and thinking about it from a corporate investor standpoint, um, and I immediately thought about my work at Allstate where I launched their um, domestic violence signature program focused on economic empowerment for survivors of domestic violence and also then went on to manage their Chicago investments where they had committed $25 million to major Chicago institutions and it was kind of my job to now to then create a strategy out of those investments. Um, but I also I had to go back a little bit and I thought, man, at Deloitte, I worked in community outreach and community development, but it predated the language of corporate social responsibility. So I was like, wow, that was a long time ago. Um, so, but I also have have that perspective as well. And then, you know, the final thing in my experience that you know I bring to this conversation. It's just this language of social innovation, social entrepreneurship, um, and that's really kind of the space I live in now, leading the, the New Options Project. I want to add another um, experience that's not mine per se, but I think it could be just another useful uh, thing for us to talk about tonight, um, is that my husband actually works for an education investment fund. So his job is to basically extract millions of dollars from billionaires um, to create more seats in high-performing charter schools for kids across the country. So their social ROI is more butts and seats, you know, at good schools for our kids. And so, you know, he lives very much in this space of performance and measurement as well as an investor that's helping um, high-performing charter networks scale. In terms of, of measurement, um, I just want to kind of share some of the things that I've done in, in my, my background from a CSR perspective, and this is really something that we were talking about as we were walking down here, um, the role of investors in measurement and, and how that impacts what you measure and what you pay attention to. Um, and it occurred to me that often it can be the tail wagging the dog. Right? So as nonprofits, we start measuring what our investors care about, and they may or may not know what measurements make the most sense. And I have to probably admit some culpability in doing that as a corporate investor. Um, so we had our own internal dashboards, but when I think about what we were looking at our nonprofit partners to do, um, you know, it was a, a lot about you know, programmatic outcomes, right? which uh, there's a theme on, I'll share a little bit later. Um, <coughs> from a, a new option standpoint, um, and I, I mean, Teach for America, there's all kinds of metrics. There's, you know, there are dashboards around, you know, kind of student achievement. There's dashboards around kind of growth. I mean, you could cut it and slice it and analyze it 500 different ways. Um, so again, kind of a very, you know, focused culture around performance and, and measurement. Um, with the work that I'm doing now with the New Options Project, uh, it's really, for me, fascinating. It may not be fascinating to you, but um, it's different because we actually are not focused on scale. So the Kellogg Foundation made a three-year, $28 million investment in, in seeding innovations that could literally transform opportunities for disconnected young adults. And that's not going to be done through a programmatic lens. What we're looking for is like creating innovations that create a more efficient and effective marketplace between disconnected young adults. And by that, I mean 16 to 24 year olds who are out of school, out of work. I'm not talking about college grads who can't find jobs. I'm talking about folks who've most likely dropped out of school or who've been poorly educated and who are now not employed. Right? So we're talking the hardest to serve young adults and helping them connect not just to jobs but to employment pathways, which is very different. It means that getting on the first rung is actually not success. It's putting them on a pathway that they can continue to move forward, continue, continue to, to grow their wages. And so given the nature of this project, we are really thinking about measurement in a very different way. Um, and, and this is where the role of investors comes in too, because I manage this investment for the foundation and they definitely want to sometimes shift to 
how many people are you serving? It's like, that's not the function of this investment, right? And so we have kind of this wonderful dance that we do when they want to slip into the comfortable things that they normally look at that are not appropriate for the work that we're doing now. So, so what does it mean to, to kind of be seed investments for innovations and measuring that work? We're looking at influence versus scale. And so we're looking at influence in terms of are other people interested in our work? Is the way we're thinking about the problem permeating other walls beyond our own? Right? We're looking at market traction. Not only are they adopting our language and our mindset and some key things around our mindset for this work are that the young adults we work with and that we're trying to support are an untapped source of talent. So we're not viewing this as largesse. We're viewing this as a real potential source of talent for employers who have a really hard time in the entry level marketplace, okay? Which is just a different frame. We're thinking about employers and having them as an important part of the equation. So employers are really key audiences for us. And then we're also thinking about kind of the broader perceptions that need to be shifted in order for us to achieve our objectives. Um, so lots of different things that we're trying to, to influence. Um, market traction. So when we've got innovations on the ground, um, and I can name kind of the three that you know will be that are hitting the marketplace and will have to learn to fly on their own after 2013 because we're in the last year of our investment cycle. Workforce.io. You should go check it out. Set up a profile. Um, We've got our Human Achievement Toolkit that's being incubated in Chicago Public Schools. Workforce IO is being incubated by the Living Classrooms <coughs> Foundation. And then Innovate Educated New Mexico is creating what they're calling a Skills for Talent ecosystem, which basically says you shouldn't pay attention to credentials, you should pay attention to skills. There's like a .0001 correlation between degree and your ability to do a job, right? I mean, so it, it's like, what are the skills you need for a job and then hire for that, not because someone checked off the, the box. For our world, this matters because often if you don't have a high school diploma, your application gets thrown out, right? So, um, so we're looking at traction for all those innovations. Are people adopting it? Great, you're you know, being incubated in Baltimore, D.C. Does, does anybody else want to use what you've got? <laughs> you know, you're doing great things in CPS. Okay, is it just CPS or other city divisions interested or other markets outside of Chicago interested? Like these are the types of things that we're looking at that are real indicators of whether or not these innovations will be sustainable. Um, and then I would just add kind of perception change. Um, in social media, we actually are um, uh, on Twitter, the New Options Project is. And um, if you told me, ask me for our handle, yeah. That shows you I'm not on Twitter. Um, I, I'm, I'm tweeted more. I might, our PR agency does uh, does our tweeting. I approve the tweets and they post them, um, so I don't have to learn anything new. Um, anyway, so um, <laughs> from a perception change standpoint, I mean we recognize that the young adults we're talking about are often viewed as social liabilities, not economic assets. And so for us to go hard at solving this problem and not acknowledge that would be you know, naive. And so we are looking at many ways of influencing perception. So you know, through traditional PR and earned media, for sure. Um, but one of the great opportunities that we have is we are, um, the Ad Council has bought into doing an employer-facing campaign that's focused on shifting their perceptions and, and getting employers to create employment pathways, so internships, job shadowing, and hiring. Um, so we're kicking off work with the Ad Council. It'll be a three-year process to get this, uh, this campaign up and launched and sustained, but that's a, a real play for us uh, towards the, the perception change work. So, you know, again, this is just what we're looking at from a new options project standpoint. The reality is all those innovations I mentioned to you at whatever point they go live in the marketplace, they're going to have to figure out what the appropriate measures are for them, given their business model. So um, so the last thing I wanted to, to just close with 
is just kind of three points, a couple I've made, but I just want to emphasize uh, that I think are probably good fodder for our discussion today. Um, one is the role of investors in measurement. And I, I just, I think it's so, so very important as nonprofits or as social entrepreneurs or social innovators that we really figure out what measurements make sense for our work because otherwise we will end up measuring things that don't matter. And there's a concept that we learned in business school called the folly, right? And it's basically like, you know, you reward A while hoping for B, but your reward is actually incenting C, right? It's like, you know, I'm not getting exactly right, but it's the idea of if you start measuring something that's really not the important thing to measure, then your energy will start to shift towards that thing you're measuring, and that may or may not get you to the end result that you, you want to accomplish. Um, this, the second point is measurement of outcomes versus impact, right? And I think we are oriented, for sure, in the nonprofit world around number of people we saw, number of people who called our number, number of it, I mean, did it change anything? Because actually, I don't care about the number if it didn't matter. And so always asking the question of what will matter for impact, not just churning through outcomes. Um, and finally, you know, the idea of like, what you measure depends. Right? Are you a traditional nonprofit? Are you triple bottom line? Are you double bottom line? Do you have investors who you know, have a vision of what the return should be, whether they're you know, venture capitalists or angels or you know, you're getting a grant? I mean, there are just so many things. And I would say we're probably in a much more complicated world with measurement than in the past because there's so many different ways of going at this role, this idea of social impact, right? You know, back in the days, like you start a nonprofit, right? Now you've got like venture philanthropists. I mean, my husband is essentially a venture philanthropist. They're structured like an investment fund, but their entire focus is social good. Um, so it's just, you know, this is just a really interesting, I think, moment for all of us to be thinking about our work and being intentional about, you know, what makes sense in order to drive change, because I think that's our ultimate goal. So that's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. I just want to make a few comments, uh, see a couple of questions, but I want all of you to be thinking about questions, and I'll, uh, I'll play Mr. Microphone and run around and make sure that you're on the mic, because we are recording this, so we'd like to make sure that we can hear your, your questions. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, um, in terms of, uh, you were talking about sustainability and, and trying to figure out how does that model work where you're self-sustainable. And um, I think this is a real tricky uh, place because um, one of the theories for nonprofits existing is what is called market failure. And that's because the market doesn't go there because it's not profitable. Otherwise, they would be there, right? So I think when entrepreneurs, especially, come to the nonprofit sector and say, What's your business model? How are you going to be self sustaining? Well, the fact is, maybe it isn't. Because if it was, Somebody would be out there saying, oh, we can make a profit doing this, right? So I think it's, you know, we need to think really uh, strongly about that. And you said you're struggling with that right now. You know, and it could, you want, you want to comment on that? Yeah. And this is what, like, I think there's a term that we use um, called social entrepreneur, right? And I think, actually, um, that's a really horrible term. Right, and I think you know, and it's stuck. We're we're stuck with it, but the fact that it's an oxymoron, right? So we have social, we have entrepreneurship. So we have social in the sense that we we want to do good. And there's kind of that that whole kind of side of it, and then you have the entrepreneur, which means market, right? And so what happens ultimately is that the entrepreneurship always dominates the social. So you have a social, you, know, you might start off with a wonderful, amazing social idea, and then you put it into the market frame, you realize you can't make money on it, and then all of a sudden you change the social so you can then make money on it. And so you go out and you claim to be in the social space, but you're really no longer doing that core mission that you really wanted to do. And that's why I think actually social innovator is the real term, um, and the better term, because a social innovator is someone who goes out and changes the market, right? And I think that's ultimately what we are. We know right now that the economy and the market that we've set up is unsustainable, 
on a, on a social level, on a cultural level, and on a, on a climate and a environmental level. And so therefore, what social innovators are, are need to be charged with is how do you actually change the market and, and figure out how you, you can do this social mission and succeed at it um, by changing the market. I would just want to add an example because one of the innovations coming out of the New Options Project, Workforce.io, um, I mean, they anticipate spinning off, creating a social enterprise, um, going on the market for angel investors, venture capital. Um, they're not looking to be in the world of getting you know, foundation grants. So they may get a mission-driven investment or you know, something like that. Um, and one of the things that we are really pressing hard on is there's a great idea. How do you make money? Especially because they're really thinking that their platform uh, is open source, right? And, and giving the platform away in a freemium model and then having your add-ons, right? Your customization, your front-end, back-end bolt-ons, your technical assistance, your analytics, you know, whatever kind of things that you can do to make that tool more effective for employers in particular, because that's quite frankly probably their biggest paying public um, and community-based organizations. And um, trying to figure out willingness to pay Right and ability to pay um, on your different markets uh, it is something that we're we're really struggling with now. And you know, if I were to make a prediction, and if I were to probably say this, I mean, I've said this out loud to the Kellogg Foundation. My guess is that they will get the investment. What is going to be the most important part of their deal is Kellogg is basically licensing the intellectual property back to them in perpetuity. So when they launch their new company, they will license back the intellectual property because the foundation owns all of that. And part of that deal will be some sort of clause around usage and preservation of intent. Because what we all believe in our gut is that there will be investors in this innovation who see the, the broad applicability. Right? Essentially, it's an online platform for early career, and it blends the best of Facebook and LinkedIn, but creates a platform that allows transparency between young adults, employers, and community-based organizations. It's a great tool. It could be used at career services at Notre Dame for every counselor and student and employer. Goal setting, feedback, um, applying for jobs, understanding what a job entails. I mean, it's all of that. And so that's just one example. The military is interested. Veterans, the v Veterans Association is interested in how this can work for veterans returning. And so while those are all great ideas and great missions and purposes, this project was created to serve disconnected young adults. And so what we guess is that the business will grow and there will probably be some sort of nonprofit arm that's going to retain the, the focus that, you know, the original intent of the work. Um, we'll see what happens, but I think this whole idea, I mean, we're almost letting go of the idea that this will be self-sustaining as, as a commercial enterprise just focused on our market. And so we're building in a way to be intentional about making sure that our market doesn't get left behind. I have one, uh, one more comment and question, and then I'm gonna open it up to everybody else. Um, Dan, you were talking about uh, the wells that, that you're building, and um, I, I know from my, I've never worked in that space, but I have friends that have, and they said that one of the reasons they, they build these wells is because uh, the people take sometimes a couple days of their life just to go get water, uh, especially the women are usually charged with this task with the children. Um, and so as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, is there a way to measure the opportunity gains of that, and and uh, because as we talk about social return on investment, they don't have to spend two days now going for water. So what are they able to do with that time, and how does that trans uh, transfer into social impact, which is what you're talking about, okay? And um, uh, so I assume you're asking those kinds of questions, looking at those things. But I also uh, it strikes me that if we really want to uh, look at social return on investment instead of how you can sustain your organization with for-profit initiatives, right, and with the profit. Um, the return on investment is really in making the world a better place. 
we really need longitudinal studies to find out what is the social impact of an education program or uh, a well program on not only the population but the communities and the and the states and the countries uh, that these people uh, become a part of and, and first of all are you measuring those kinds of things but second of all uh, are there funders that are talking about funding these kinds of longitudinal studies that you're going to need if you really want to prove this uh, so the, the answer to your last one is I don't know. We haven't seen it yet, right? Because the, the more um, complex that it gets, like you can tell this phenomenal, we can tell a phenomenal story, right? To take the first well, Vashraj program in India, right? So the full story is I go out and raise $5,000, send it to Sewa, they build the well, right? They tell us within like um, the span of a month. Two women started small businesses because they weren't walking miles. So there's a flour mill and a grocery store that popped up because now they have four hours of their life back, right? So that's impact, right? Far beyond that we, you know, my small brain ever even imagined when we first did, you know, like, hey, we're going to provide water, right? Um, and so, and then it gets into now the, you know, the girls can go to school, right? So now you have an educational impact, right? And so a lot of the longitudinal impact that have is like the tail on it is phenomenal, right? It just keeps going and going and going. And, um, but when you sit down with a funder, a lot of times we'd be like, listen, you know, we're citizen effect and we're providing this uh, ability for people to fund these small, like critical projects that, you know, provide water and then have these kind of, you know, long tail impact. They would look at us and be like, "Great, but we want to, you know, so I'm like, give, give me a million bucks, and I'll turn your million bucks into ten million bucks for water." I'm like, oh wow, that's great, but I want to give my million dollars to Sewa for their water projects because they're so dialed in and hyper focused on their one core mission, which is you know maybe solving the water crisis and others that. Um, the innovative thinking on that might be coming a little bit, like the Knight Foundation's doing some pretty innovative stuff and others, but I haven't seen kind of the, the groundswell of, of that kind of funding. Um, and at another point, I completely just blanked on it. So do you have uh, another? Okay, so we're going to open this up to everyone. So uh, have your questions ready, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay, right here. This is primarily directed um, towards Dan, but I'm curious. Um, presumably, when you're talking to your, you know, investors, you need to um, indicate some indicators, or you know, show some indicators of what your expected success will be. But since so much of what you do um, is sort of, you know, the ripple effect, how do you provide those predictions? That's the problem. Right, I think, you know, just to be really honest, I think, like I said, we started this thing and um, really had no idea what we were getting into and had almost reverse engineer what we had started. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, we have, have the high class problem of getting these reports back on the impact it was having on communities um, that at times, not every time, far exceeded what we expected, right? And, you know, that's then complicated by the fact that we're working in India, um, in Gujarat, and you know they speak Gujarati, you know the Gujarati dialect, and so you know get, gathering the data turned out to be a monumental effort, right? And so we the the basic simple model made a lot of sense. Let's find great existing partners that are credible and doing phenomenal work. They will then collect the data and get it to us. Right, but when you separate yourself so far from the data, it's hard to then get this like long tail data of going on because you're you're just not there. And so I become a, a big strong component of um, it missed me on my high horse. Start with yourself, right? And so I look at like this citizen effect. I went off. I started this you know quote unquote global organization, and that's all fine and good. But I'm still drinking water out of a plastic bottle, right? I mean, how can I credibly go around and say I'm helping solve the water problem in India when I'm doing this? And on top of that, you can actually go to India and build wells and cause drought, right? And that, I think that's the other thing of you really have to think through like the social good that you're doing, right? So I think in, in every you know any social entrepreneur or social innovator has to look at themselves first and say. 
am I living my life in a way that is equal to the values that I'm you know, squawking about up here at the University of Notre Dame at the Better Good Conference? And then secondly, um, kind of understanding how um, you know, the road, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And so let's really look at um, social good from the standpoint of the community and let, putting the community in the center and letting the community be the decision makers in a lot of ways because they're living it and they're knowing it, they're the experts, right? Um, so that's my little high horse for the day. I mean, I think you have, it's interesting because I think that we all think we know the story we want to hear. So, I mean, I do think part of it is the story, right? Because you're going you're gonna to connect. The initial connection is going to be hard. What extricates the money is often a combination of heart and head from, from an investor's standpoint. Um, and I think we are maybe at a moment of inflection in terms of just the nature of the dialogue and the conversation about what is needed to really have kind of optimal social impact. So, you know, I'll, are you guys familiar with the idea of collective impact? Um, you know, FSG, Connie and Kramer. Um, backbone organizations, like if I think about the work that I'm doing with new options, what makes it work is that Kellogg actually invested in a backbone organization. Now, that wasn't the frame when the strategy was written because the Collective Impact article hadn't come out. <laughs> it came out about the time I started this, this job and the strategy was written well before. Um, but I think you know, that's one example of an increased appetite for less direct kind of um, return, right? It's like, because we have more effective management, because we're sharing information across silos, because we have a shared goal, because we're able to leverage all the resources of the investment towards a greater perception shift which primes the market, then, then the innovations can thrive. And the innovations will then tell a different story. But you know, having the courageous investor who will be willing to put money behind the backbone or the platform. I mean, really, what I'm hearing, it's like you're, you're kind of like second cousin twice removed, right? It's like you're having the impact in the community, but really it's because you've created a platform that's an enabler, and because that just doesn't connect in a one-to-one -one way, it's, it's, a, it's a little more challenging um, to, to tell the story. But I do think we're kind of in this interesting point. Um, and I've had conversations with the Annie and Casey Foundation and venture philanthropy partners who are like, man, that Kellogg invested in this is great. Like, the backbone is so important. Like, what can we learn? So one of the things we're talking about with Kellogg is how do we do a case study on their courageous investment, how we've done this, and, and how, because there's something to influencing how this business of in, social investment and philanthropy gets done. Um, I want to just comment on the gap in like people willing to invest in longitudinal studies. I mean, I think about like when I was at Teach for America, my fantasy was like, man, wouldn't it be great? I mean, there are kind of small studies here and there. Year Up is another organization I work with now with new options, doing great work. And the best we can get is really like short-term studies that provide a snapshot. But if someone was willing to put the money behind a 10-year study that showed the life impact of, of XYZ program over time and then what that meant to, I mean, that would be so powerful for philanthropy and for social innovation. Um, so anybody who has access to, you know, real money and real investors out there, uh, let's start bending their ear. Um, and just to build on Dan's comment about your intentions and what you're trying to do, I think the idea of unintended consequences is real in this space, because it's like we live in a vacuum, and we're like, oh, this is a great idea. And then it's like, what are all the effects? I mean, one of the things that I struggle with with new options when I took the job, and I continue to be very mindful of, is people said, well, aren't you afraid this will just make kids drop out? And it's like, well, they're going to drop out anyway. I mean, the reality is we have 6.7 million young adults who are disconnected from school and or work, and we are not servicing them. No one's talking about them. You know, I live mostly in the ed reform space, and we talk about to and through. No one's talking about these kids, because they don't make it through. So we can either provide an opportunity 
that may engage them with, with learning, make meaning of it, contextualize it, and get them back engaged with education. But like, I had to really think about what could be the unintended consequences of this work. And I think for all of us, we have to always reflect on that. So I would, two things I want to say to that. The last part was brilliant because it speaks, you are, by saying that, is changing the market, right? What you're saying is, you actually might, so what? Like, so what if someone drops out and decides to go to your program? Because if it, you're, it's providing a better path for them, then that's phenomenal, right? Like, I, we, and I think what we need to do at the high level, and the mindset shift that has to happen, and it's nothing new, it's happened, it occurred in the past, but we're living in a time where we do have this hyper market focus, and the only thing that we use to measure value are dollars, right? And that is kind of the world we're living in, and I think um, we need to and we need to start thinking about what, how do we measure value and what do we value as a society. And so, therefore, you know, there's you know, I think about the, the example I gave one time was I was um, at a conference and I was we were talking about alternative markets, and I'm like, listen, I hang out with my kids, and it's the most valuable time of my day. I don't turn to my son and say, give me 50 bucks because it's, you know, I just gave more value to you and helped you grow into a great person, right? Um, actually, I'd probably, you'd probably have to, you know, I'd have to pay him. Um, but that's, I think, as we think about social innovation, a lot of it is kind of knocking down um, this thinking that dollars are the only way we value things. And it gets, you know, that gets to the funding. When you can start saying, listen, we as a society, value this. This is important for us to invest our time, you know, our dollars and our, our blood, sweat, and tears into because we love it. We value it, right? Um, that's what we need to really start working on. Um, and I, that going back to it, that starts at home. That doesn't start with me trying to build wells in India, right? That actually looks at me looking at Fredericksburg, Virginia, you know, Woodlawn Terrace, you know, subdivision. Like, that's where, honestly, a lot of this needs to happen. And uh, as far as measuring social impact, um, a lot of um, governments in Europe, like Great Britain, have actually done that, measure quality of life and, and social impact. But we here in the States have not quite gotten on that train. So if you want to read about that, you have to go on the web and find stuff from the Great Britain. Dan, actually, while you're doing that, I did want to, there are a couple of things that I wanted to just say specifically measuring. Like, we actually have measurements for market traction indicators. We have measurement for influence, which is like, how did conversation with A have a ripple effect? Now, that's a private measurement, because you can't tell the federal government that I influenced you. But like, our team is very deeply engaged with the White House Council on Community Solutions and the Summer Jobs Plus strategy, which were huge Obama administration DOE initiatives last year. We were behind the scenes. We're measuring that, but like we can't go out in public and say we're influencing, you know, all that. So we're looking at that. We had um, in our New Mexico work a test group and a control group that is literally kind of measuring the intervention, which often doesn't happen in this space. In uh, the Baltimore work, we're looking at not only platform usage, but how it translates to jobs, and then how that translates, you know, to retention in jobs. So I wanted to, like, there are very kind of specific nuts and bolts, like we're talking more philosophically, but there are real nuts and bolts about, you know, what we're doing with new options, for example, around measurement and evaluation. So I just wanted to add that. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I belong to a local anti-trafficking group here in town. Um, it just seems like me and a couple other people are just working and trying every week trying to convince the people of South Bend that human trafficking is going on right here in our own community. And you know, we just have a small group of volunteers that are doing most of the work and stuff. And I keep sometimes saying that just because we have a couple of people working on it, am I failing here? Yet we've had some little micro projects, one big project with some other people. And just yesterday, I mean, excuse me, this weekend, I was at a conference and I just ran into some really incredible folks that are actually willing to sit down with me and work out a plan where I can establish a safe house that is available for victims of human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. Was there a question or are you just want to make it? No. I'm okay. Right. Yeah. My question is, how do you volunteer those little and big successful things? Is there some formula for that or whatever? 
I don't do my own tweeting, but social media, I mean, you know. Let me give you this, okay. Just, and I'll, I'll let Dan add to this. I think in your situation, this would be a place where you really leverage social media. Um, you know, Twitter is the most measurable, which is why we've chosen it as our strategy, which is, I, mean, I can tweet on my phone, but I just don't know my handle because it's already unlogged in. Um, but, uh, but we use that to, one, join into conversations, but also to influence conversations. We're thinking about what are the appropriate hashtags that we want to reference so that this will come up in you know, feeds of people who are paying attention to these issues. So I think it's a pretty straightforward, if you got any, probably 80% you know, of the people in this room, um, or a high schooler who could tell you about social media, I mean, like my 18-year-old nephew has like 300 followers, I'm like, who in God's name would follow you? But that's a whole other question. <laughs> they could really inform you, <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, they can really help you, I think, figure out how you do this, like, on no money, but really start to build awareness of the work you're doing in association with others who care about the topic. And so, and this content is king, right? And so I think, um, you know, my wife works um, and leads a group that her and her mom founded called First Peoples Worldwide, right? And so they works with indigenous peoples all over the world. And it's a constant reminder that as a society, one of the most important things we do that makes us a community and a society is tell stories, right? And it's, it, there, it um, helps us remember history, it helps us share what we're doing, and it helps us address and, and realize, in your case, the problems that are happening in our community, right? And so how do you, you have, there's this horrific story, right, that uh, around human trafficking uh, that is taking place right here in South Bend and around you know, the country that nobody knows is happening. And so how do you kind of take that and tell a compelling story on it? And then, um, and so that's, that's number one, like a compelling story and get it down. And then it's the distribution of that message, right? How do you get the story out? Twitter is a low cost, free cost, phenomenal way to do it, right? Um, but what the other key, the real key to Twitter is not the 140 characters, it's actually relationship building. Right, it's being able to connect with people. So there's there's a weird thing going on right now in the market where you can email, and you can phone call, and you can fax a reporter, right? And you will never hear anything back, right? You can do it till you're blue in the face. You tweet them, and for some reason, there's still this weird ego stroke where they're like, "Hey, dude, thanks for you know, the tweeting. I'd love to talk sometime." So um, it, it's it, it's a trite kind of silly example, um, but it is getting the story down in a compelling way and then just being really creative and using your free social media tools to connect with the right people that you want to tell the story that you know holds your audience. Other question? There was, he was the Over gentleman here? in the back next to him. Right here? In the black t-shirt? Did here? you have okay, anything? Okay, and then we'll go over here. He's, sorry, he had his hand up like the first round. So. This guy? No, in the black t-shirt. Here <laughs> Yes, on. <laughs> so, um, when doing, uh, when a, a uh, philanthropist or a government organization is looking to donate money and they're looking for organizations to contribute to that they think will provide the best return on investment, um, they're mostly looking at data that is put together by the organizations that are soliciting the funds. Is there uh, a conflict of interest there? Do you find that when competing with other nonprofits that you uh, feel you're up against people that may misrepresent their impact? And is there a role for third party program evaluation in sort of improving the overall quality of nonprofits? First of all, nobody in nonprofits ever lies, so, right? I'll let you. I'll let you. Like take the deeper dive, but I mean, here's the thing, right? Even if you are like the most trusted research, you can make data say whatever you want it to say. I mean, right? So you pick the data that tells the most compelling story for your organization. Now, as evaluators of programs, we should be smart and ask for you know apples to apples data, right? So we can make good decisions. Um, but part of what people make decisions on is information, part of what they make decisions on is relationships, 
right? So, so I would say like it's unfair. <coughs> I don't, I don't know, even if there was a third party, you still have kind of other dynamics, because you can look at all the financial records. You can, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there is free and public information that could give you at least a consistent fact base that just often isn't sought out because people are grabbed first with their heart, and then they look for the story that, you know, it provides confirming evidence. That's just probably a cynical view of, of that question. So this is where I would say, be a darn good storyteller for your organization. And, and, and the, the honest, dirty secret, and it's not very secret, is that you know, in foundations, wealthy individuals, um, corporations, when they're donating to individuals, it, it, or they donate to individuals, right, and a story more than the organization. So sending in blind grants, there's a lot of people out there writing those grants and making a living doing that, and they're very talented, but um, they'll always get beat out by the charismatic, dynamic person that someone from X Foundation saw speak at a panel and, and they're going to get it. But to answer your question directly, you know, there's GuideStar and Charity Navigator and these others out there, right? Um, and, but they're radically trying to change their approach um, because they've been in this, you know, decade-long thing of breaking down the expenses on fundraising, administration, and program, right? You need to have a certain ratio and program, otherwise you're not spending your money wisely, right? That didn't work for Citizen Effect. 100% of our budget was operating, it was uh, non-program, right? Um, but because of the ways the rules were written, we could say that all of our money was towards program. And so it, like, it be, it, so the, on a lot of the social innovation folks kind of made guys start charity, um, charity navigator look almost silly or irrelevant. Um, and so they have like ch uh, either Charity Navigator or GuideStar just acquired social actions. And they're like literally acquiring these other organizations to help them try to get to what exactly what you're talking about um, and break out of the old way of thinking. The question is whether or not that will be successful or not. I'm going to go over here because I haven't gone to this site. Then we'll come back to you, OK? You're a rightist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, I just have a question about how you, um, well, how your project, you know, whether it's education or wells in India, um, it, did that sort of evolve? I mean, like, or did you know that that specific, that that was what you were interested in? I mean, I'm in the field of human trafficking as well, and I keep having these ideas of where I really think that, you know, my background might be most suited, which is actually education, one thing. Um, so it's kind of changing a little bit, and I was just wondering how you, sort of, both of you ended up in the fields that you're in. So it's, so it's, it's kind of funny because um, my husband, like, education is his thing. Like, it is his life's work, and I'm like, I don't see it changing anytime soon. Like, this is going to be what he's doing. Um, for me, you know, I like dating <coughs> issues. I mean, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek with that, but I like, I think part of what you need to figure out is what you like to do. I like doing a certain set of activities. I like starting stuff. And so I like coming in and operating at the intersection of like translating strategy to reality, figuring out what it means in the real world, adapting that. Um, dealing with the human side because there's always people and managing personalities, etc. And that's what I like to do. And I can do that around a whole host of issues. So my list, women's leadership, diversity, um, uh, domestic violence, uh, like civic, kind of hometown civic engagement, education reform, and you know now I think I'm probably operating at the intersection of workforce development and youth development probably more so than education. Um, but I'm always doing some combination of those sets of activities that I like to do. My husband will have, he was chief learning officer at KIB. He ran a local charter school and now he's a, you know, partner at an education investment firm. He's always going to be in education, but he's going to wear different hats, but he, his thing is the issue. For me, it's the content. So I think for you, it's figuring out where to apply the weight to help in directing your energy. Um, yeah. So first off, your husband sounds way cool. So, he is way cool. Um, absolutely. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, just to kind of um, add to that, the generalist versus specialist, right? So I, in my whole life, have wanted to be a specialist, but every time I get into something, I just have to remind myself I'm a generalist, right? Um, and so that was, on a personal level, if, honestly, if I was starting a nonprofit again, uh, I don't know if I ever would, but um, I would go specialist all the way. Right, because um, I was out there for you know, several years trying to raise money for a generalist platform. Right, we tried to make it specific. We tried to like narrow it down, but at the end of the day, um, it was a platform that any nonprofit could actually use, and there's a lot of benefit to that. But when, especially when you're in the um, you know the fundraising mode. Um, and um, going after something is a lot easier to get in, in you know, kind of a very, like, um, human trafficking, right? You, you know where to go. You know who funds that. You can talk about one thing. You can be an expert in that one thing. Um, but that's purely my own personal opinion um, on that. I think it's, uh, you know, easier. I like what my wife does with indigenous issues. And I'm like, God, I wish I could just talk about indigenous issues all day. So... <laughs> I'm a I'm a big believer in uh, in measurement and, and uh, specific result, but I also recognize that it only falls into sort of certain subset of the world. Right, not all of our world is is quantifiable. A bit of our world is uh, qualifiable. And Angela, you mentioned a lot of your interests. It, it, it makes sense. Many of your interests can be quantified. Right, that that there's a dis, uh, a distinct result that can be achieved, but can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of where this is appropriate, what, what world, what, what donors in particular, uh, you know, this, this resonates with obviously in the church, uh, it might be a little less, uh, less relevant, you know, where a lot of the money goes. Well, I think it's part of painting a, hol a holistic picture. I mean, I think you always want to know your market, right, and what they care about. Um, well, you know, I'm an accounting major, and I can go to the, the measures, and you know, the business person, and I want to. At my heart, I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to always talk about what the work means. And I will tell my team all the time, I don't care what the measures say, because if we're not making a difference in the lives of young adults, ultimately, it doesn't matter, and it's going to waste of time and money, like period. And so. I think there's also the qualitative piece, like what is your qualitative analysis? What is the narrative? What are the stories that give life to the issue that you're, you care about? Um, and I think investing as much in the quantitative as well as the qualitative, right? Because the qualitative brings to life the data. The reality is anybody who tells you they're really studying the spreadsheets, they're not. They're going to find that one, or those one or two data points that resonate with them, and that's what they're going to focus in on. And so it's like, what is your most powerful data? And then what stories illustrate that data in the most meaningful way? I mean, so I have you know, done a number of interviews, and probably the most scary one that I did, um, I, was, I did a live interview on the Andrea Mitchell reports. And I had just taken on this work, probably was six months in, and I felt tremendous pressure. I'd done like local, I'd done like taped, but to be like live on Andrew Mitchell, staring into the camera, I wasn't in studio with her, I was like, oh my gosh. And it was part of Education Nation, and that's important because often dropouts are discussed as part of education, right? And so I felt this huge pressure to represent this work. So I did media training with this amazing, amazing woman um, who's a reporter and worked with, you know, Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw, etc. And she was like, one data piece for each point. Like, if you rattle off five data pieces, no one, you're going to lose people, they're not going to remember, they're not going to care. So thinking about kind of that ratio of the measure, like the, the statistical measure, the quantitative measure, and then kind of the qualitative illustration. So that's, that's how I would think about you know, how you go about telling, telling your story um, and being compelling. I absolutely agree. I think the, um, the big thing is up front, set your metrics. 
just decide what they're going to be. They'd be like, listen, this is how we're going to measure mission. It's going to be on lives impacted or, you know, kids in seats or whatever it might be. And like, these are our mission metrics. And then these are our business metrics. And just nail them up front. Make sure you're always measuring them. Make sure you always know them. Make sure they're there on that sheet, right? But God, please do not go in and start rattling off your metrics. I mean, you just nailed the, the nail on the head of like, you need to bring them to life, right? And that's where the anecdotes come from. No one ever gave Citizen Event any money because they were like blown away by our metrics. They were blown away by 550 people in Bosch Rajport Village got water and two women started um, small businesses, right? That's all I needed to say. And people were like, wow. And then they're like, well, does Dan and his team have the integrity and the skills to grow this up? Because they haven't done anything yet, right? Um, and he so, said, yeah, that's like, you did say that very well. Question over here. Yes, sir. This question is for Angela concerning new options. Uh, is it real new? Uh, yeah, I think so. Is there anything locally? No, so we are seeding innovations in um, what we're calling kind of test markets. That's probably the best way, way to put it. Um, we're in year three, starting year three of a three-year investment cycle. So project is kind of in the wind-down mode, like getting into market and funding stops. Um, and we are in Chicago, Baltimore, D.C., and New Mexico. Um, and with all of those innovations, they're, they're looking at kind of how they grow in their next market. So the Baltimore work is expanding to Chicago. They're also, they've had some interest from the Twin Cities, um, and they're also in D.C. because it's Baltimore, D.C. Chicago, they're also working with the Twin Cities. There's a lot of work in that area around kind of creating multiple pathways. Um, and so this is a nice fit for, for all of those efforts. Um, the Baltimore team's also been gotten some interest from New Mexico, um, from uh, New Orleans, I'm sorry. So they're expanding in a very measured way into to other markets. Um, you know, there are a couple of key elements, you know, and they vary by, by effort. But so for Workforce IO, they need a big employer. They need, you know, or, big, or multiple employers who are going to be willing to put their jobs on this platform. They need a strong CBO with who's able to deliver the young adults, but also deliver the quality coaching and support that they need to be successful. Um, and then, obviously, the young adults are actually using the platform. So, really growing at the most micro stage and, and building out. Um, for New Mexico, they are much more, I would say, a state-based focused system. So California Community Colleges is adopting, you know, a portion of this approach of a skills-based ecosystem. Um, they're also looking at Dallas uh, and Michigan. Um, so kind of combination of states and cities, but they've got kind of systems saying, we want to do this. So it just kind of you know, all depends on kind of where interest is percolating, um, and then the right players are aligned around the idea, um, and also capacity to, to grow. Um, that's that's a real con question for us as we, you know, try to emanate out. A question back here, and then we'll come back over here. So the question I have is, is it enough? So you have these metrics to measure impact, but then there's the question of, is the impact large enough? Right, so I'm an economist, so I'm always thinking opportunity cost, cost of benefits, and I'm wondering, you know, what's the impact of my current project, or are my efforts better suited elsewhere? Um, or is it kind of an appropriate asset? Is it enough to say that, you know, if one life is impacted, that's enough? a simple question. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? <laughs> so my answer to that is if you're impacting one person, it's absolutely enough, right? And I know that's you know seems to be a very idealistic thing, but um, I think one of the worst things that ever happened to economics was something called opportunity cost. Right? It's um a cop yeah. <laughs> it's, it's um, it, you know, the other thing, you know, the other one is parsimony, right? Kind of parsing data and looking at one thing only. And so 
Um, opportunity cost is a counterfactual. You can never prove the opposite, right? And so you you can live in the world of regret, regret with opportunity cost, or you can you go forward and do what you do and do it well. Um, and if you fail, you, know, you fail, right? But a lot of what we're talking about here in the social space, um, you know, social innovation space, whatever you want to call it, is mindset shift, right? And so. Um, I was going to save this for the closing comments, but I'll say it now. Um, the other thing that um, needs to die a quick death is scale, right? We, the way we think about scale in this market and in this country is um, one of the fundamental problems, right? And especially as you translate it to the social space. Because what we do not need in this country is a bunch of um, nonprofits or social organizations trying to become the Walmart of social good, right? We, because once you get into the scale mentality, what you're trying to do is dominate. You're trying to own, you're competing, and you're all you're trying to do is win, 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 get as big as possible, be the black hole for all the funders, and be the thing that everybody goes to. Um, and that's not what we want, right? We want, A, number one, people to talk to each other, to collaborate, to work together. And we want, we want you to be a virus, right? Go out. Be a virus, put out something in the world that's so valuable that people want to steal it from you, right? And it's not stealing it, it's replicating it, right? And we will, that's what we want. Um, and so I think um, as we think about, you know, I think about the human trafficking comment before, I'm like, brilliant. You know, you've already succeeded, right? That's a, a phenomenal. What we want is you to hear the same thing, to have a conversation with him. And, and you know start you know start sharing ideas, start stealing ideas from each other. I want to connect you to my old office manager who sits on a human trafficking hotline um, from like 8 p.m. to like 4 a.m. every weekend night, right? And so like that's what we want. We don't want to scale. We want to kind of go viral and replicate um, and collaborate together on this stuff. Um. So to go back to the question of opportunity costs, which I don't think it's the root of all evil. Um, I actually think about it all the time and probably have conversations with my six-year-old about opportunity costs. But anyway, um, I think the question is opportunity costs for you or for the investing institution. I mean, I think you make a personal choice about where you want to spend your time and energy. Um, and I guarantee there's always something else you could be doing, right? That may be as fruitful, as meaningful, or not, or pay more money, or whatever those kind of things are that you're assigning value to. Um, so I think kind of that is a very personal decision at the individual level. Is it worth it for you, right? Um, from an institution standpoint, you know, it's so complicated. Like, we're talking about these measures, but quite frankly, you know, if I think about the Kellogg Foundation, this $28 million investment is pretty much grandfathered in, and we've got a whole division that's mad because we're taking all their budget because it used to sit someplace else, and then they restructured their priorities, and so it got moved into that area, so they only have this small amount to spend because we're taking all the money. I mean, the reality is institutions shift priorities all the time. We used to be early childhood, now we're going to be disconnected young adults, now we're going to be place-based, then we're going to do this. So they're, you know, they are thinking about opportunity costs of their investment, you know, depending on, on where their priorities are. You can't control that. With what's within your control and what's worth it to you. Um, it, the whole idea of scale, um, to go to Dan's point, I'm a little all over the place because I want to think these points all kind of respond to you. Um, well, let me go, go to something else first. In terms of whether it's worth it to you, I would ask the question of, is it unique? Um, so I have an idea, you know, around using, um, I'm putting my idea out there, so if y'all can do it, do it, um, around using crowdsourcing or microfinance to help college students, in particular, like first generation or kids who are coming from, you know, low, low socioeconomic backgrounds, deal with small money problems. I mean, $500, $700, I had an intern, $700 was keeping him out of college. $700 freaking dollars, excuse my expression. And 
I was like apoplectic because you know the reality is it was might as well have been seventy thousand dollars. My husband was like, well, do we just you know do we pay it so he can go back? He had a scholarship, couldn't access the scholarship until he paid seven hundred dollars. And how many kids, even kids here at Notre Dame, I have plenty of friends who didn't come back because they owed you know I wasn't called the Burks, so I forget what it's what it's called the registrar. You know, and they couldn't pay that thousand dollars or fifteen hundred. So how do we solve that problem? And I was talking to the the new CEO, of Frequency Five Forty. So ROI Ventures is now Frequency Five Forty. And the CEO used to be CEO of Starcom. He's they have a venture capital firm. He's a great guy. And we were talking, and he's like, "Does it merit a new nonprofit?" Does this idea merit something new? Is it unique enough to stand on its own? Is somebody already doing it? Is there an opportunity to collaborate? Is there an opportunity to be the aggregator? So maybe there are already 20 organizations already doing that, and what's the real problem is distribution of information. Getting it to the people who need it so that they can use it to solve their problems, right? So I think those are all the types of questions in terms of whether it's worth it for you that, that you need to be asking. Um, and then figure out if you can collaborate or if you can aggregate, and that becomes your solution. So, and I'm, I'm quite frankly very much in the mode of thinking through that very question for, for this issue that drives me insane and you know problem I want to solve. Um, and then the last thing is I think, you know, we talk about collaborating and partnering or aggregating. The reality is like we're all human, right? And as much as we want to be humble, we also have egos. And I do think that we live in a world when we talk about scale, where many nonprofits are striving to be, you know, the Walmart of whatever the <coughs> issue is. And the reality is, those of us who start with an orientation towards social good become involved in institution building. So then our focus becomes more on preserving our institution than on solving the problem. And I don't know how to solve that, um, but but it's it's a challenge. Like you came into existence to solve something, and many of our you know world's problems are intractable and deeply rooted, and it will take a lifetime. But we have to think about what drives our decision making, whether it's solving the problem or preserving the institution. Um, Another comment on that is, I think we have to understand that we are the prisoners of our own mindset, right? And I think that you know we we act within our current constructs, right? And um, we just because we feel that's normal. And I think the whole idea, and, and that's ultimate. That's actually the major battle that we're having right now as a society is saying, okay. You don't have to think this way, right? The whole like the competitiveness that we have with each other is a trained behavior, right? It's because it's in, it's that's the society that we've lived in, you know, our whole lives. It not all societies are like that. We haven't always been like as competitive as we are now, right? And so I think part of um, part of the challenge is um, forcing yourself into these new types of behaviors, right? I think. You know, there's. Um, I always hear all the time it drives me absolutely bonkers. Is you can't change behavior. You can't change behavior. Listen, I did like spend my life on this five years ago, right? I can tell you right now, you can change behavior, right? And so, what's you know? Sorry to use a crass, awful analogy, but what's the cocaine and crack for social good, right? And I think that's what we need to come up with. A, s a crack for social good. That's. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, we had a, a question over here, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, so you were talking before about the importance of having good partners. And I'm kind of on an adventure myself trying to work with agricultural co-ops in Nicaragua, and that's one of the questions we have is, you know, how do we measure the co-ops that are most effective and that will, will do the best job at going out and or recruiting farmers that will then be the most effective? So there's kind of this trail of measuring the effectiveness and, and how do you how do you think through that trail of not just measuring the effectiveness of the partners that you're working with but helping them have the right metrics in place to determine that they're working with the right people as well. So take some answers and then wrap it up. Okay. All right. Um, so first off let them determine the metrics. Sorry. The yes. 
<laughs> Let them determine the metrics. They should set their metrics. They're living in the society. It's their home. It's their life. They should set the metrics. I, you, know, you guys, number one. And then get local, right? I think um, you need to have, you should just listen for a long, long time. Just listen. Um, talk to the people. Who's, who, who are the farmers? Who do they respect? Who's everyone bringing up? Because um, if, you're, if you're in a smaller community like that, it's going to come out, right? Um, but you, you have to all, it, be very, very aware that you will be the prisoner of the partner and the person that you're, local person you're working with. Um, a great example is from my wife's organ, organization. They were working with the, um, the San in Botswana, right? And the San um, are some, some of the oldest people on the planet. They uh, were um, kicked off the Kalahari Game Reserve um, by the government and then reinstated onto the um, Calgary Game Reserve after winning a Supreme Court case. It's a, um, it's a phenomenal story, but still has a doesn't have a good ending yet. But the, the point is, they were working with this guy. Um, we'll call him Bob, right? And Bob was their the guy. He spoke English, um, and you know, so he was really one of the only people they could find to be their guy going to talk to the son. Um, and we were sitting in this meeting after the, the our person got back, and the, she, she said, um, yeah, one of the questions I asked was, you know, how is Bob doing, right? And Bob was asking that question, right? So it's kind of a joke, be like, well, you can't ask them how Bob's doing when Bob's going to give you the answer, because Bob Bob's going to tell you whatever he wants to tell you. And it came out that the community didn't really like Bob. Right, and so they were, you know, the filter by which they were getting all of this information was very skewed um, to the point where they're not even sure if the, the information is very valuable at all. So um, spend the time, you know, build the relationships and just do a hell, hell of a lot of listening. I, I would say, um, just airing all kinds of dirty laundry today. I mean, I think. You know, one of the challenges in, in the ed reform space, and, you know, I, I kind of chuckle because I think those within the organizations that can tend to consider themselves the ed reform movement, I'm like, do other people think you're the movement? Right? I mean, that's, that's valid. Like, if people outside, it's kind of like if you're a leader and no one's following you, then you're really not a leader. Um, so, the idea of when you're looking to affect change, doing something to a community versus with a community, um, and that's just another way of you know really reinforcing Dan's point. Um, you know, being on the ground, listening, letting them tell you, because often we presume to know. We have the charts, we have the books, we have all the smarts, and we think we know, and we presume to know more than those on the ground. And we talk to them in a way that they know that we presume to know more than they do. Um, and so I think humility and really engaging on the ground is critical. Um, and I say that with that reform because that is probably the thing I'm most intimate, you know, intimate with from a, from an issue standpoint. Um, but it's probably every issue, quite frankly. Um, the other thing that I would add is that. We were sitting down, it was, uh, we had a meeting in Baltimore last week, Kellogg Foundation, myself, and one of the anchor organizations, one of the teams from Living Classrooms Foundation. And we were just kind of chatting away, and one of the things that came up is just the idea that all of the organizations funders love, the people who are actually doing the work think they're crap. And they're always like, why do they keep giving them money, right? Because they've been like, you know, bamboozled. Like they, they have said all the right things going on, they've told the right story, they've made the, the data. Like the people doing the work actually know who's having the real impact. And so I would say, you know, talking to the farmers, they know the co ops that are the best, right? So really getting on the ground with those who are doing the work and letting them tell you who does it the best versus going to the Ministry of Agriculture, right? Because they're probably the ones who bought the story of the people who you know, are Bob. So. You're going to get the answer indirectly. Like when you ask, ask the question directly, who is the best co op, right? You're going to get a, a different answer. It's going to be through listening, through all the conversations and building the trust based relationships that it's going to come out. It's not going to be through a direct question. Okay. 
Okay, do you have some wrap up comments that you want to make? Sure. Okay, we're going to wrap this up and um, do some closing comments. So, um, thank you so much for sitting here and being here later and, and even just showing up. Um, so, the year I graduated from Notre Dame, um, that summer I had the good fortune of hearing the Dalai Lama speak at the Field Museum in Chicago. And he said something that I actually forgot for probably 10 years, and then uh, my mom reminded me during this whole citizen effect journey. And it was the United States um, has the best institutions of higher learning for the brain in the world, right? You know, you have like Notre Dame and Harvard and Stanford and Yale and those, those schools. Um, he goes, but who's spending any time on the education of the heart, right? And I think this gets to a little bit of the question of like, um, around um, opportunity cost, right? And then for me, what is critical is um, when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat thinking about your life, are you happy, content, and satisfied, and proud of what you're doing? If the answer is yes, affecting one life is fine, right? Um, if the answer is no, even though you're um, supposedly to the metrics impacting a million lives, you're probably not doing the right thing. So I'll leave you with that. I don't even know how you go after that. But um, I, I think that there is an important message in the blend of head and heart. Um, and we have to be proselytizers <coughs> to an extent, right? Um, so you're going to see all the spreadsheets, all the data, and everyone's going to want you to report on X, Y, Z. But it's up to us to be the ones who fuse the ideas of head and heart. And as we're telling our stories with data, we're bringing it to life with people and impact. And um, when I took this job, one of the things that the person who hired, when I took the job internally, um, my friend who's Suzanne who hired me said, you know, we need someone who can balance the head and heart. And even as I, I go through a 360 process with the foundation and my team, um, as part of my review process, and one of the overwhelming comments that comes back to both sides is about that blend of head and heart, right? Moving us forward, making sure we're paying attention to the right things in terms of the results we want to be driving but always, always keeping disconnected young adults at the center of the work and the ultimate goal of making their lives better. Um, and I take great pride in that, and I think for when we get the pressure to forget about the human side, we have to really rebel and, and kind of preach the gospel of heart and head. And the reality is if someone wants to give you money and they're not aligned with you philosophically around heart and head, you probably don't want to take their money because that will, no doubt, take you off task. Thank you to both of you. And uh, just a little closing story. The, the, uh, the word philanthropy uh, came from the myth of Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus was a titan. Uh, and he um, didn't like the fact that Zeus had stolen fire from the mortals. Um, and so, uh, because it's going to replace the human race, he thought they were a bunch of silly people and stupid and imperfect. And so Prometheus stole the fire back and gave it back to the mortals so they could have heat uh, to make tools and food and they would have light uh, so that they could create, not only survive, but create better lives. And the gods called him, uh, derogatorily, um, a philanthropos which is a lover of humans, and why would you love these silly human beings? And out of that came the act of philanthropia, which is now what we call philanthropy. So, at its very origins, in the myth of Prometheus, philanthropy has always been not about giving money, but about giving people the tools to make their life better. And I think as long as we continue to do that, no matter what the metrics, then we're doing the right thing. So thank you all tonight uh, for coming to the Greater Good Series, and uh, have a nice evening.